Hello, Saint. You are now listening to the teaching sermon from the God Life Assembly Joss. May you be blessed as you listen. Father, we bless you. From our souls, we bless you. Our souls truly bless you. Can you gather your soul together and bless them? It's possible you just sang a song, right? But you were not fully conscious of the things that you were saying. So just one more time. Gather your soul and let your soul bless the Lord. Listen to what you're saying and say it to the Lord. It's not a song, it's a state of your soul. Let your soul bless the Lord. The Bible says, and all that is within you blesses you. Which means everything within you can come together in a posture of the blessing and is blessing the Lord. Let everything within you right now just bless him. Lift a song, oh my soul. Lift a song, oh my soul. 
Declare His goodness, goodness, His His kindness, His wonders from age to age. Father, we bless you. Our souls magnify all that is within us. Stop to bless your holy name. It's because you're worthy. It's because you're worthy. It's because there's not the time that we stop to really reflect on who you are and what you've done. That it doesn't compel a song out of us. There's not a time. There's not a time. You're all together lovely. You're all together beautiful. You're all together wonderful. What you do to us, whenever we stop to reflect on who you are, this is our conclusion that you're good. That you're good. And tonight, Lord, we say you are good. You are good. Tonight, Lord, we declare that you are good. We proclaim it that you are good. Let our circumstances hear it. Let the devil hear it. He's the one who comes and attempts to convince us that you are not good. Let him hear it. You are good. Let him let the devil, let the demons hear it that you are good. And you are good and only good you are. It's not that you are good and you are sometimes. No. You are consistently good. You are not sometimes one kind. You are good. You are only good. You are only good. Let the heavens hear it that you are good. Let all that is within us hear it that you are good. Let my soul hear it. Let my mind hear it that you are good. Let my emotions hear it that you are good. <laughs> Let my will know that you are good. May I 
that will end in two weeks or one month or ten years that day has not been born my redeemer liveth is my consistent declaration the day I was born than to curse God. Say it again. change who God is. God is not looking for praise. He's not looking for anything. He doesn't need anything from you. He's eternally satisfied. He didn't come here so that he can gather praise. He's not looking for praise offering. Whenever you magnify the Lord, it's for whose good? It's for my good. That he remains highly lifted up. It's for my good that he is exalted. It's for my good that he fills up my horizon. And that can be your perpetual state. Amen. Whoever told you that today God can be magnified, tomorrow you belittle him. Then next tomorrow he's magnified and you belittle him. No. God can stay perpetually magnified in your eyes. Regardless of life circumstances, God can remain. So say with me, in my eyes, God stays highly lifted up. Hallelujah. Amen. And these are some of the things we do when we come before the Lord. This one, you don't get it because you read the Bible. No. You get it because you've experienced something. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, we bless you this evening. We love you, Lord. Our faces turn towards you. And our countenances brightened. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Welcome someone around you. Have your seats in church. sure you've welcomed everyone around you in front of you behind you to your left to your right you have to do it all around but can you buy i'm standing here i can't remember when <laughs> church this evening. Amen. The Lord is our dwelling place. That statement is a reality from when the psalmist said it. It's more a reality now that the Lord is our dwelling place. We don't visit the Lord. The Lord is not in this building. Praise God. Because when we say blessed are those who dwell in your house, you know, some of you are thinking it's Caleb and Joseph we're talking about. You are, you are, you are the one who dwells in the house of the Lord. And the Lord dwells in you. You know, if they had told some people this, and the old covenant, they wouldn't have believed it. That God was going to dwell in men, in human temples. Bless the Lord that the Lord lives inside of you and you live in him. 
Hallelujah. And you see, if that's your perpetual state, that song says, for they will still be praising. How? Why? Because they go from strength to strength. Strength to strength. Amen. There's something about the presence of God. It's real. It's not something we made up in church. There's something about the presence of God and its effects on your life. Anyone who is conversant with the presence of God, soon enough, there will be fruits in their lives that you will not find in the life of someone who does not know the presence of God. The presence of God changes us. The, 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 you know, the countenance of God is another way of saying the presence of God. And in number six, you find out that the countenance of God blesses us. It doesn't only bless us, it changes us. It dwells with us. It makes us. Amen? So there are blessings in the presence of God. There are things. You get things. Amen? Amen? God still give gifts. Amen? God still does what? Give gifts. When you come before a king, you know, the kind of king that God is, he gives. That's his nature. Acts 17 tells you that God is the giver, the giver of all things. God, God does not come to you to receive. Amen? Amen. God does not what? God's character is not receiver. If God takes anything from you, he takes it to bless you. Do you, do you hear what I just said? If God takes anything from you, he takes it to do what? To bless you. God is giver. He gives. His nature is that he is benevolent. Which means he gives without finding fault. He gives without reason. Do you understand that? He looks for reasons to give. And even when he can't find a reason, he gives because he is his giver. It's one of his names in the Bible, giver. Praise God. That's the name Paul used in Acts 17. He calls him the giver. He says the giver of life to all. Hallelujah. God is what? Giver. And when we come before him, God, God gives. He still gives gifts. You come before the Lord. God blesses you. His countenance blesses you. Amen. But in his countenance also is the heat that you experience. Is what? The heat. And what does the heat do? The heat is the resident power of God. So when you come before the Lord, you come in his presence. What are you standing before? His power. And his power can do anything he wants to do to you. Do you understand that? God's power can open blind eyes. God's power can raise the dead. Zafi, that's the heat that is in God. Right? God's power, God's power can, can accomplish things that your labor and your efforts cannot. God's power is a quickener. Amen. Amen. How many of you know that he cooks things faster? Hmm? Praise God. But also in the countenance of God is radiation. Say with me radiation. And what does radiation do? It changes you. It alters your DNA. It reconfigures you. Radiation is swallowing up your humanity. That's what the presence of God does. Amen. When Paul said that he desires that divinity will swallow up humanity. How does that happen? It's in the countenance of God. The Bible calls God a son. God is what? He's a son. He's what? He's a son. Scripture calls him the son of righteousness. In Revelations, you're going to find out that perpetually God will be a son. Right? Revelations 22, God will be a son. He would, he would, one of the, one of the states God will exist with us for eternity is as a son. Amen. Amen. He will be the son in that city. That city will, not, will have no need of sunlight for the Lord, Yahweh, will be the son in that city. And what does a son do to you? It changes you. It does what? Changes you. It, radiation changes you. Radiation deforms you. 
But you see, before, before the Lord right now, your humanity is what has deformed you. So that son, it deforms your deformation into reformation. I, that's God. That did not bless you. It blessed me. Just saying it blessed me. That when God looks at us in our current humanity, we are the ones that are deformed. Hallelujah. For the Lord God is a son, Psalms 84, verse 11, and a shield. The Lord bestows what? Favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. That's who the Lord is. Praise God. Hallelujah. But you see, the son is a blessing when the son stands where? Right above all that is in your life. Amen? I hope you know that when the sun sets, the sun still exists. It's just that it's not in your horizon. The sun is still there. It's just that it's not in your horizon. Stay with me. The sun is in my horizon. And he stays there. You see, that's, that's really what scripture teaches. That, that, that with God, there's no shadow of turning. Right? There's no, there's no variableness. You know what that means? That, that came from an ancient system of telling the time, the sundial. And in the sundial, when you keep the sundial, how do you know the time? You tell the time by the shadow that the sun cast on the dial. So if, if, um, if the sun is this way, the dial casts a shadow this way. And because the dial is casting a shadow this way, um, those who are good at using it can tell you, oh, it's two in the afternoon. But there's a time when the dial has no shadow. What time is that? When the sun is dead center 12 noon. And listen, the sun never sets on you. You didn't hear what I just said. The sun never, for with God, there's no shadow, which means what state does God exist over you? 12 noon, perpetually. God never shifts to 1 o'clock. Steady 12 noon over you. Who is it that turns? You are the one. You are the one who looks at him today and says, Lord, you are good. Right? Right? Then your landlord calls you and says, I've increased my rent from 350000 to 800000 because I know there's a landlords are competing right now as to who will increase the most rent. As if it's a competition, they want to see the winner. Who will increase the most rent and their tenant will not cost them or leave. <laughs> Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. It's either one, you don't pay rent. <laughs> Someone else is paying for you. No, there are some that they don't pay rent. Someone else is paying for them. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. And your landlord threatens to throw you out. Then you, st and then you say to the Lord, Lord, you are good, uh, but you are goodish. Yeah, I was, so, someone uh, in in. Uh, I think on, on Friday, she kept using the word ish, 20-ish. I, I said, what is this ish? Where, where is it coming from? You know, um, uh, it's morning. I'll come around 12-ish. <laughs> is it a thing? Is it a thing? Ah, okay. He's <laughs> ish. <laughs> Praise God. Who turns? The Lord's character over you is constant. Constant one. Endless is your love. Like a river you can be stopped. Your faithful constant one. Who is like you God. Your mercy is like the sun. Always rising. Over us, constant one. Endless is your love. 
like a river can be stopped. Your faithful, constant one, who is like you, God. Your mercy is like the sun, always rising over us. Go and get that song, listen to it. It's by Stephanie Gretzinger. I had a season of my life where I listened to that song for months. It, um, it, it gathers your heart. Who is it that turns? Who is it that turns? Because hmm. 2 Corinthians 3 says that if anyone turns to the Lord, have you, have you read that in your Bible? If anyone turns to the Lord, why? Why, why would scripture start by saying, if anyone turns, and I hope you know that scripture is talking about the countenance of God. It says, if anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Where those veils, where are they? Yeah, on your face. And then you behold face to face, and then you are transformed or transposed. You are what? You are transposed. You are, you are upgraded. Listen, there is upgrading God, but it's only for them that turn. Did you hear what I just said? What God is, is constant. If you turn, you will find that God has been waiting. God never went anywhere. He doesn't turn. He doesn't change. He's constant. Are you following? Are you following what I just said? Hallelujah. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. <laughs> turn. Just turn. Tell your neighbor, turn. And I believe this is why, this is why you know, we had to, for a brief moment there, just stop and, and magnify God. And we said at the beginning that it's for whose good that the Lord says magnify. It's for my good. You're not doing it for God. Get it right. Get it right. It's when you hail the Lord, it's, it's, a, it's a strange technology, Pastor Rampi, but when you hail God, right? When you hail God, you release some Yoruba chants on God. God doesn't just get bigger and says, wow. Gabriel, did you hear that? That's me they're talking about. No, it's not about God, it's about you. That's never been about him. It's about you. I need you to get it. That when you hail God, it's about you, not about God. It, it positions you right under the sun so that you can receive of the fullness. Amen? Amen. It what? It positions you. I don't even know why I'm staying here for this long. This is not what I came to. I, I wanted us to, to, you know, finish our, our, our study together just because some did not finish. But I know I'm staying here for someone, right? That if you, if you, if you simply turn, it positions you. Listen, God does not change. God does not have sides. Yeah? God does not have... It's you that chooses whether you are on the Lord's side or not. Who is on the Lord's side? I am. It's not, Lord, tell me whether you're on my side. It's who is on the Lord's side. I am. On, say, I am on the Lord's side. And the Lord is. Uh -huh. So there, that one. It doesn't mean that when you say I'm the Lord's side, then the Lord will now rush to your side. Hey, I've chosen. No. <laughs> The moment you choose to be on the Lord's side, what is it? The Lord is on your side. Because you chose to be on the Lord's side. Amen. 
Amen. As long as I live, as long as I live. Let's say it again. Who is on the Lord's side? principle of honor comes in right this is actually what it means that you honor the Lord do you understand that do you understand this this is where the principle of honoring the Lord comes from that you honor the Lord when you say I honor the Lord what you're saying is that I will keep you where I'll keep you in my horizon that's what it means to honor the Lord. It means that there's a place you've given the Lord that nothing else can come near, nothing else can take. It means there's a place that the Lord has in your life, right? Right? You And listen, whose responsibility is it that the Lord has that place? It's yours. God is not intrusive. The Holy Spirit is not intrusive. None of them will force themselves to take a place in your life that you don't want them to. They will never do that. Praise God. None of them will force themselves to take a place in your Whatever place the Lord has in your life, you give it to him, you put him there. And honor is visible. Honor is clear. Honor, honor over time, anyone can look at it and relate with it. Amen. And I know, I, I know that, you know, but the Lord is compelled to interact with us on the basis of how we honor him. Does that make sense to anybody? Does that make sense to you? I know some of you will say, oh no, but he's God and he's love and he should insist on me. No, God will not insist on you. You have to be the one to place him there. The Lord should know that I really love him. So he should make himself. No. God doesn't do that. Actually, let me tell you. God in scripture clearly um, works extra time to make sure that he gives, you, he gives you over to the things that you honor more than him. When you, when you come to the Lord in your desperate hours of need, God will either respond to you by mercy, and that's if you come by mercy. Did you hear what I just said? God will either respond to you how? By mercy, and that is dependent on whether you came in by... Because, listen, a lot of us don't understand that we are the ones who get to choose our mode or manner of transactions with the Lord. Do you understand what I just said in that statement? That we are the ones who get to choose our mode of transaction with the Lord. This is what I mean. Rampi, if you come to the Lord upon the basis of the things that you have done, God will be forced and compelled to treat you on the basis of the things that you have done. If you come to the Lord saying, Lord, 
I have done this, I have done that, I have done that. Thus, I qualify for this, for that, for that. The Lord will be compelled to go and check whether you actually qualify. But you can also come to the Lord and say, Lord, I tried this, I tried that. But you know what? That's not the day for that. I know you're a good God. I choose to come by mercy. Then the Lord will be compelled to answer you by mercy. That was, that, was, that was the core of the parable Jesus was sharing between the tax collector and the Pharisee. The tax collector came, um, the, the, sorry, yeah, the tax collector came and said, Lord, look at me, I'm a sinner. I, I, listen, does it necessarily mean that the tax collector has not tried? The fact that he was in the temple weeping, praying, told you that he's a man of a thousand efforts. But every day he looks at how his efforts fall short of the perfection that is in the Lord. So when he comes before the Lord, what is he saying? Lord, forgive me. Have mercy on me. The Pharisee came and said, Lord, I fasted. How many times? I, I gave my tithe. And not only my, I even gave my tithe of mint and cumin. I gave tithe of all that you, I mean, Lord, look at me. And Jesus said, ask the question. He said, who do you think will return home justified? Who? Because if the Lord will choose to count and measure us by, that's why anyone who comes through Christ already comes through mercy. Is why God does not count what we have done. Do you understand what I just said? But when a man is now in Christ, God looks at the internal posture or the formation of his heart. And in the formation of your heart, God will answer you. He's compelled to answer you according to the idols of your heart. Does anyone understand that? Yeah, God does. God answers you according to the idols of your heart. Without force, without compelling you, God wants to see where you place him. That one is your choice. Amen. You know, that, that's the reason why. Let's, let's, read, let's read a few scriptures in this light. Right? Let me just say a few more things in this line. You know, the <laughs> Second Chronicles two. Second Chronicles two. of us understand that that our believing God right our believing God is the is the first indicator that we honor the Lord how many of us understand I, I know that you have been taught honor you know your offering you give an offering to show the Lord you honor him I hope you know that that's not that's not the first thing that honors the Lord what's the work of the Lord what's the work of the Lord believe the first honor you give God is believe it's not what you give the Lord. It's what? Believe. When you, when, you, when, you, when you believe the Lord, it's evidence that the Lord has an 
important place in your heart. Believe is the proof. When you doubt is the proof that you, you distrust and you question the integrity of the person who has called you to follow him. Amen? Listen. Say it with me. My first sign of honor for God is that I believe in him. <laughs> That's it. That was exactly what Jesus labored in the entire book of John to get the Pharisees, the Jews, you know, to understand. All Jesus was doing in the book of John is to get them to believe him. I hope you know. I hope you know that. And what he was trying to do by that is, and they will simply not do that. Why? Because um, they are looking at Jesus and they are not convinced, right? That he is deserving we like you. You are a very good prophet. There aren't many like you. But where you are asking us to put you, you don't look like we should put you there. Doesn't make sense to you. It wasn't that they, they totally disagreed that Jesus is deserving of some kind of... No, it's that where he's asking them to put him by believing in... For them to say, we believe in you. It means that they have put him in the same status with God. Because God is the only one who when he speaks, if you honor him, your first response will be, I believe. When you dishonor God, when he speaks, your first response is, but why? But how? Do you understand what I just said? Does anyone understand what I just said? There's, there's a popular scripture is why I went to 2 Chronicles. It's a popular scripture there that we've always read. L listen to it. Verse 18, from verse 18. 2 Chronicles 20 rather, not 2. 20. From verse 18. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem did what? Fell before the Lord, worshipping the Lord. Right? Right, what did they do? They fell before the Lord, worshipping the Lord. Doesn't that show you that they honor the Lord? Is that not a mark of honor? Next verse. Verse 19. And the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korhites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice. Doesn't that show you that they honor the Lord? Then verse 20 says, And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. What did he ask them to do? Believe in the Lord your God. Believe his, so shall ye prosper. But I thought they just demonstrated honor for God. Right? They bowed down. They worshipped. They sang. And Joshua got up and said, yeah, you did those great things. But what brings God the most honor and compels God to respond without a doubt, without question, was not that you sang and you bowed down. Is that you what? You believe. But well, listen. The second mark of honor is that you believe those whom the Lord has sent to you. Listen, no man can say they honor God and they dishonor the one whom the Lord has sent to them. It's not possible. John explained that to us. He said, no man can say I love the Lord whom he cannot see and hate his brother whom he can see and claim that he Loves the Lord. This duality is always there in the Bible. This principle of two, where the Lord, um, love the Lord your God with all your heart. How? Second law, love your, why? It's only in loving your neighbor that in your love for the Lord can be revealed. If I say, show me that you love the Lord, how will you show me? It's loving your neighbor. God cannot be, how do you show me you love him? 
Why would you go and find him to give him that three hour hug that will show us that you love him? Do you, do you understand what I just said? Where will you find him to give him the, you know, that your special beans porridge? The one that the recipe comes from your great grandma. How, how would you show the Lord? Because these are some of the elements that we used to say honor, right? How would you, where would you find him to give him that beans porridge? Nowhere. Just, when you find Rampi and give Rampi, what happens? He said he actually likes the red beans. So maybe, maybe you know, the sister that will succeed, she will finally open up the way because we have been trusting the Lord. He just told you now, the key to his heart, red beans. It's not red beans. It's red beans. <laughs> Listen, this is how God still works. Did you hear what I just said? This is how God still works. When God wants to bless you, the first thing he does is he gives you people. Not the second thing. Not the third thing. The first thing God wants to do if he wants to bless you is to give you. He will plant certain people in your life. And God help you that you wake up every day and go to church and say you honor God and despise those people in your life. God bless you. I watch and wait to see you go far in life. I'm not threatening you. That sounded like a threat, but truly at the end of the day, it sounded like a threat, but it's not a threat. And I believe these are some of the principles that sometimes we are not being taught, most especially in our kind of circle. You know, I've asked myself perpetually, why don't I, why don't I really find it easy to talk about some of these things? I mean, it's, just, it's, just, it's just the nature of Listen, I know you may not like some of the men of God that the Lord has given you. The, the promise in scripture is not that you like them. It's to believe. Your interaction and relationship with them is not that you have to like them. Do you know, let, see, when I say it, people don't understand what I mean. But let me say it again, right? Without a doubt, this is something that I can boldly say to God's people, holding the microphone in front of God's people. I don't, I'm not under pressure to be liked. Do you know what I just said? I actually don't care. Right? It's, it's a, so, you know, if you have a problem with it, right? There are few transformers around I can recommend. <laughs> but I really don't care. And let me tell you, do you know why I don't care? It's because of the freedom I found in not caring. The moment I've tasted that freedom, there's no way I can go back to the pressure of wanting to be liked. My goodness. The basis of our interaction is not that you like me or I like you. It's belief. Do you understand what I just said? If the Lord sent me to you, what is it that you should have for me? Belief. You don't have to have like. But you see, if you are wise, you have what? Belief. You don't have to have like. But if you are wise, you have Listen, we expect, because men of God have failed a thousand and one times, we expect God to change how he works. God is still not going to change how he works. If God wants to bless you tomorrow, he'll still send you a man. Probably another broken one. Just like the last one you ran away from. And God expects you to still give yourself, to be taught, to be spoken over. I know some of you will say, well, I've, I know the Bible. I read the word of God. Listen, listen. The kingdom of God is not flat. Tell your neighbor. Tell the other neighbor. Because this is...
is one of the doctrines of demons. Running around trying to convince all of us that the kingdom is flat. Do you know what I mean when I say the kingdom is flat? There is no hierarchy. No order. There are no authority structures. The kingdom of God is not flat. <laughs> it, see, Jesus leveled, then reestablished a new order. Did you get what I said? Listen, it breaks my heart, right? This is what I mean by it breaks my heart. You know, there was a time, Pastor Rampi, I, I kept asking the Lord, why will, it's not, it, it really bothered me because there was a season of my life where I felt that, that, um, uh, and this was, this was a, a long time ago, a while ago. I mean, those who are around me must have heard me share this story a couple of times. I, it was an important question that God will insist that my life seems to be tied to the lives of other people. Right? I, I, th I think I've even shared it here in church that it looks like um, um, I feel I am ready, Lord, for this thing. And then the Lord says to me, but look at these people around you. They are not ready. So it looks like God is perpetually slowing me down because of, and I said to the Lord, no, this can't work. I didn't come into the world with anybody. I have my own race. So let me journey my journey. So I would go back to the Lord. I remember, I remember that season of my life for months. It was a problem. And this is how I've always interacted with the Lord. Sometimes problems can sit. You know when I say problem, do you know what I mean? Questions, inquiries can sit on my head. It's there. I've read it in the Bible. But I don't really understand why it must be that way. God needs to... So it stays that way. I still remember I was on my way to Kano. That was when the Lord began to answer me in the vehicle that day. And the Lord said to me, it is by the same principle that Christ will die and you will enter into the works of another. He said, how do you expect that when you now enter, then I change the modus operandi? No. Oh. The same technology that we receive good is the same technology we endure the weight of others. Did, did you understand what I just said? And so it looks like, it looks like, you know, God would, would, you would want the Lord to find a way to, you know, stop this. <laughs> is anyone with me tonight? Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe in his prophets, so shall ye prosper. And that's the way the Lord does it. I wish the Lord can change his operation. I wish he can change style, yeah? Don't you wish that? Jamaica, you don't wish that the Lord can change style. Eh? Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to believe the people he sends out. So you've never been there before where you're struggling to believe someone the Lord has sent you. <laughs> no, the Lord should change it and just make that see, Lord, once, once I just believe in you, let it be settled. We can remove this human equation from how you do things. Yeah. I, I want, I want, yes, you agree with me. I have a few people that agree with me in the building. If you agree with me, just wave. Yeah, look at us. Yeah. The Lord should remove the human equation from our transaction. Remove it. Go up. You don't agree. That, that means you are not my friend. No, oh, if the Lord removes it, listen, results will be faster. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because I understand the times I came and I sat down and the person talking to me, the person offended me last night. I have two warfares. First, I'm battling with the infrastructure of my mind. 
And some of you have giant skyscrapers of unbelief in your mind. So you are battling with the skyscrapers of unbelief in your mind. And you are battling with the vessel. Abba, remove one layer of warfare. So that all I know is I'm dealing with my mind. Once I believe, ah, settle. <laughs> it's still the way God works. Broken vessels, sometimes not so polished, yet still the way God works. Hallelujah. You see, you know, how many of you understand the effect of this in your work with the Lord? I did a teaching recently um, in, in the Zaria church. You know, and there was something I began to mention here, you know, that I went to teach there. Ah. There are technologies in God. Say with me, technologies. And what I call a technology is a system that God uses to do what he intends to do. God doesn't just do things because he's powerful and he can. But he does things with technologies, with systems. Right? And one of the systems that God uses in your life. Listen to me. Let's read. Let's read. Let's read a scripture. Let's read. Let's go to um, Zechariah. Zechariah. Zechariah 1, 18. You know, when the Bible talks about the devices of the enemy, a device is a, is, a, is a technology. Say with me, a technology. So you understand that the devil also has technologies, but God also has technologies. Amen? What's a device? When the Bible says, Don't, do, do not be unaware of the devil's device, he's talking about a technology, a spiritual technology. And what is that device specifically that Paul was talking about when he said, do not be unaware of the devil's devices? Blessing. Let me show you what that device is. So, come sir. Paul is saying that blessing has done something, right? Blessing did something wrong. And because blessing did something wrong, um, he decided to call blessing to point out to her the wrong that she has done. Do you understand what I'm saying? And in pointing out to blessing the wrong that she has done, I hope you know that this enterprise can come with offenses. Actually, the natural nature of confrontation and rebuke in the church comes with offenses. How many of us understand that the church has not yet started to learn the art of confrontation? How many of you understand that we're supposed to be the ground and the pillar of truth, yet, and you can never ever have the ground and the pillar of truth without, how many of us understand that every single time anyone gets up to attempt to, what do we interpret it as? What do we interpret it as? Okay. I know you know what I'm saying. So just be keeping quiet. You understand? I'll be doing... I know you know exactly what I'm talking about. So um, I'll move on, all right? I'll move on. You know, let's just pretend that you don't know and I didn't say it. But I know you know. All right, so let's move on. This is... can sometimes get ugly. And so, you are Paul. Paul said, now remember there was, no, there was no phones for Paul to call and find out how far, how did the conversation go? Has it been resolved? 
Has the guy repented? Has the guy returned to the Lord? Has blessing returned to the Lord? Has she admitted her fault and returned to the Lord with repentance and with the commitment to bring forth fruit of repentance? No, Paul didn't have a phone to call. So Paul wrote him and said to him that when you guys resolve this thing, and finally decide that you will forgive blessing and restore blessing to full fellowship. Says, I too, even though I'm not there, I also forgive blessing. This is what he's saying. Paul is saying, I'm giving you an, an if code to execute. Programmers will understand this, right? That if this condition is satisfied, Execute this code. Does it make sense to anybody? This blessing. So, if this condition is satisfied, execute this code. If you decide that, oh, this conversation didn't go well, and blessing is not forgiven, and you are casting her off fellowship. These, those are things that we don't talk about anymore. They are still in the Bible, I hope you know. They are still in... And you have to, you know, do you know, what, do you know what fellowship is? Fellowship is koinonia, is intercourse. What, if you don't cast that thing out, it has the tendency to enter into the seed for the next generation. That is how we allow strains of strange seeds enter into our pure lineages. Sometimes that's why you have to cast out certain elements. Because if they refuse to change, you have to... Right. Okay. So, Paul is saying that the moment you decide that you forgive and restore, if it's resolved, then I too have forgiven her. If it's not resolved, then I too have not. Then Paul added, because we are not unaware of the... So what is this device? What is this device that Paul is talking about? This is a device that if blessing has done something against us and he has forgiven blessing but he has not forgiven blessing what did we just open ourselves up to it's a device did you hear that it's what it's a and this device is what the enemy can enter into and walk in our midst. Did anyone get the device? Because I know you always say we are not unaware of the devil's devices, but you leave it blank. In the context of this scripture, this is the device. The device is that we must agree. One cannot be saying, I forgive and restore. And another is saying, I do not forgive and restore. You see, this crack that it opens up is where the enemy enters and sits. Then he starts to work in our midst. Does it make sense? And Paul said, we are not unaware of the devil. So, if you forgive her, I forgive her also. So that our ranks are what? Closed. The moment our rank is closed, that device of the enemy has no place to enter into our midst. Do you understand that? Thank you, sit down. And this is still a device the enemy uses. This particular device. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Do you understand why some people will use their entire time of ministry? Two hours. And all they are doing is talking about another man of God. That is what? That is what? A device. And I don't care that it's men of God that are doing it. It's still a... And it's working. Amen? 
Amen. Please go back to my scripture, Zechariah 1, from verse 18. Let's read. Then I then lifted I up mine eyes and saw, and behold, how many horns? Four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What be these? And he answered me, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And the Lord showed me four carpenters. Then said I, what come these to do? And he spake saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah, to scatter it. Now in this single verse, you're going to see two Two very important devices. I just introduce you to the concept of device. Amen? And that's really how the enemy works. When we say device, that, that's what we mean. That the enemy uses our formations. He uses um, certain postures, certain elements. Th those are the ways that, listen, without these devices, the enemy has no access to you. Do you understand what I just said? Do you understand what I just said? That if two people are in perfect unity, right? That it renders... It renders them foolproof against certain devices of the enemy. Do you understand what I'm just saying? There are certain workings of the enemy that you cannot find in the midst of a united people. There are certain workings of the enemy you cannot hear of in the midst of a people that are one. Praise God. So here Zechariah saw a vision and what did he see? Four horns. How many horns? Four horns. And these four horns are the devices that scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And when they were done with Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem, the Bible said no one was able to lift up his head. So these are devices that when they were done with Judah, Israel, Jerusalem, everybody walked how? Heads bowed. How did people walk? Which means when these devices enter Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem, they are horns. What are they? Horns. When they entered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem, when they were done with their work, what happened? Everybody's countenance was downcast. Shame. No one could lift up their heads. Amen. And just in case you think that these devices, they are, no, they are, they are not. Go and read the book of Revelations. You're going to see these horns working and, and still working and working and still working. Entering into the body of Christ to the degree that we are unaware of them. Because listen, some of these devices, it's not because we want the devil. It's because we are ignorant. And what's our ignorance? Our ignorance is not that we have not read the Bible and heard it. The Bible told us that we should not let the root of bitterness grow. Did the Bible say it? Your ignorance is that you don't understand why the Bible said that. So in your mind, it's just a redundant law that has no end. God is saying it because God doesn't understand that people can offend you. Did you understand what he said? Every instruction you find in scripture has a purpose. Do you understand what I just said? Every law, are you with me? Are you still with me? Every law you find in scripture has a, has a purpose. It has something it is working. Because you are ignorant of it does not mean that. So at the least, even if you don't know why God said don't be bitter, first obey. Believe it and... I've, I've, I've told us before that, that the first response of the believer is not necessarily to understand, is obedience. Understanding can catch up with an obedient person. But understanding, you don't wait to understand before you obey. 
in the formation of faith of the love of the believer, understanding does not go ahead of obedience. Obedience is first. Then, I believe is first. When the Lord shows up and says this and this and this and this and that, what's your first response? I believe. It doesn't matter the the impossibility of what God just declared. What's your response? I believe. I believe. Understanding can follow later. Amen. <laughs> Listen, that's the difference between Mary and Zechariah. Mary believed first. Then asked, how shall these things be? Zechariah didn't believe first. He asked, how shall these things be first? So that he could believe. Two different responses. They're not the same. So listen, if the Lord says, watch, watch, watch bitterness. Or the Lord says to you, um, um, watch your Dishonor, or the Lord says to you, watch. The real reason is you don't understand necessarily why. So your ignorance is always part of what makes us, you know, fall to these simple devices. So, but watch, listen to me. Oh Lord. So, let me give you a quick history, right? Quick history class. Are you ready for it? Listen, I'll be fast. Just quick history class. Assyria was the first nation that came against Israel. Now, I hope you know that only David and Saul, David, Saul, Solomon, only three kings were the kings that ruled the United Israel. The United Israel was the Israel before there was a division. Are you, are you, are you following that story? After Solomon, Solomon's son came and then there was a division between Rehoboam and Jeroboam and one of them took 10 tribes. The other was left with two, Solomon's house. And it was even because of the faithfulness of David that the Lord, it wasn't because the boy was, had sense. It was just because of mercy. The mercy that the Lord, the sure mercies of David that the Lord had promised, had promised David was the reason why the Lord left two tribes. And those two tribes, they were still, because of David, they were still the custodians of the promise of the coming Messiah. Does it make sense to you? So, um, the other northern kingdom went, found then another capital city in Samaria, and they had another place of worship in Bethel, and they continued to worship there, right? Now, um, all the two nations continued to exist side by side until Assyria perpetually came. You know, they had enemies, they'll come, they'll fight, they'll win, they'll fight, they'll win. They kept going until Assyria came and finally defeated and took the northern tribe. And there were many prophets that came, prophesied, 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 asked them to repent. They refused to repent until Assyria came and Assyria took the northern tribe. Are you following so far? And when Assyria took the northern tribe, um, part of the system that Assyria operated was that they will resettle, resettle people. There's a technical word for it. There's no point using that word. But they would take the people from here, take them elsewhere, and reset. So, like, they would take people from Bokos, then they will take them to another place where they totally cannot understand the language, settle them there, then take another people from here, settle them. It's just so that you are never able to come together again as a whole to even think of arising against the dynasty. Does it make sense to you? Are you seeing the device? There's a device there. What's the device? Let's keep them divided. Divide and that was exactly how they have kept the over 300 tribes of the middle belt powerless. And yet the middle belt is supposed to be the strength of this nation. They planted seeds of discord. Now means divide and rule. It's still a system that the colonial masters used against us. Where did they learn it from? The Assyrians. When you keep a people mixed and divided, different, different tribes, many in one place, divided, what happens? They will never be able to come together and rise against the oppressor. Praise God. Let's leave Nigeria because, you know. And it took them about 120 to 150 years before Judah was taken into captivity. 
Are you following? Now, within that time, the Lord sent prophet after prophet after prophet to prophesy, warn them, tell them that they should repent. The Lord does not want to do this. But if you don't repent, if you don't repent. So they kept insisting on their ways and then the Lord finally, you know, they went and Babylon came. Babylon took them into captivity. Now, Daniel will see a vision in Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 4. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a vision in Daniel chapter 4. Daniel saw a vision in Daniel chapter 8 and both of them are the same thing. Right? Nebuchadnezzar saw this, saw this statue. And what was the statue like? The statue had the head of gold, the chest of bronze, the chest of silver, thigh of bronze, and then iron, mixture of iron and clay. And in that, in, Daniel gave the interpretation. What did Daniel say? Daniel said that Nebuchadnezzar, you are the greatest king that has been and will ever be. Which means the earth is never going to see another king like Nebuchadnezzar. Have you ever considered that? That there will never be another civilization that will ever rise to be greater than the civilization of Bab Babylon. Babylon is the greatest civilization. You see, that's why the antithesis to what you call the kingdom is Babylon. Do you understand that? The Babylon is the head of that system that is not of God. Then the Bible said that the next kingdom that will rise after Babylon is what? Silver. What is silver? The Medo Persian Empire. The Medo Persian Empire came and after that the Grecian Empire Greeks after the Grecian Empire and the Romans the Romans are the feet of iron mixed with clay right and so what you see here are four kingdoms how many kingdoms four kingdoms and I hope you know that all of these kingdoms ruled Israel I hope you know I hope you know what was the kingdom that took Israel into captivity Babylon but Babylon at some point released them to return. But even after they returned, I hope you know that the Medo Persians ruled over them. After the Medo Persians, who else ruled over them? The Greeks. They were Hellenized. That's why when Jesus showed up, Jesus did not speak Hebrew. What language did he speak? Aramaic and Greek. Amen. By the time Jesus showed up, Hebrew was already a dead language. It was only used for liturgy. So the same way you come and read it for service and interpret it, when you are done, you go back out. What language do they speak on the street? Aramaic and some Greek. Does it make sense? That was how even their language was taken from them. But in each of these nations that ruled Israel, is a device. Say with me, a device. Because every horn is a device. And every time these devices are done with a man, what's the effect that the man is not able to lift up his head? So what's the first nation? Babylon. How did Babylon rule other nations? Babylon ruled other nations by glory. Say by glory. By beauty. That's how Babylon ruled. As much as they went and conquered them by military might, how did Babylon rule them? It is by glory and by beauty. Babylon was so beautiful that they would want to stay. Are you following me? Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold. Do you understand that? He was the head of gold. So Babylon is always going to be... How many of you understand this simple statement? That there is a glory in the world that the believer will perpetually almost always contend with until he arrives at knowing true glory. How many of us understand that this is exactly what keeps enticing us in the world? How many of us understand that the temptation of Jesus came? The, what did Satan say to Jesus? He said, look at the glories of the world. Right? They are mine. I will give it to you if you do it. If you bow and worship me. Do you understand why Babylon always had a statue that required that if you, if they release the sound, what do you do? Everybody bows. The glory of Babylon comes to make you bow. Listen, that's the first device. What's the first device? The first device 
is that the world wants to present itself to you so beautiful, so glorious that you can't say no. Why is it that every child wants to be like Rema? You know, someone said something recently about this Rema of a boy. Um, that, um, um, you know, you know, you know, you know, Rema, Rema announced that he was going to Lagos, Lagos, um, University of Lagos, right? Okay, some of you don't know. Oh, oh, okay, okay, no, I know what's happening, right? Even if they know, they will, they can't know it because they are in church, so they don't need to, they cannot show, they can't acknowledge that, you know, they know the gist. All right, I get it, I get it, we're together, right? So, Rema said he was going to University of Lagos. Andy, everybody wrote jam and applied. <laughs> yeah. The kind of people that applied for University of Lagos this year was unprecedented. Because one little boy said, he's going to University of Lagos. Then he tricks them. He changed his mind. Then there was an uproar everywhere. Little, little girls leaving secondary school are angry that Rema tricks them. Okay. How will a little boy like that, your daughter or that you have been raising, labor in the morning devotion every day for 18 years? Come on one day, one little rascal gets up and says, I'm going to University of Lagos. And this girl, will write jam with your money. The, mo the jam form you paid for. And she will put, she wants to go there because that boy is going there. What is that? It's the language of glory. And that's how Babylon talks. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But you see, the Medo Persians, they are not like Babylon. They are not. The Medo Persians are different. When the Medo Persians showed up, show up, what they do with you. So let me hurry up, right? I, I don't want to stay here too long. What the Medo Persians do with you, they don't they don't lure you. No, not necessarily. They don't, they don't try to lure you by glory. The Medo Persians take your identity. Say identity. That's a second device. Say your identity. That's what the Medo Persians take. So when the Medo Persians come for you, what do they come for? Identity. Identity. H how many of you, how many of you, how many of you realize that One of the outstanding quality, and, and I know, and I know it's a it's a blessing, right? Because God used it for a blessing. But how many of you understood why Esther could never say she was a Jew? What what made her have to hide her identity? Because that's the device of Medo Persia. Medo-Persia takes your identity. Medo-Persia does not want to leave you like a Jew living in Babylon. No. Medo-Persia makes you like a Persian. Do you understand that? The third horn, the Greeks. The Greeks, their own is not about identity. And I hope you know all of these are layers upon layers of devices that the enemy comes at you at. When the enemy sees that he has lost you from the world, you are no more in the world. Do you understand that? It means somehow that you have examined two glories and have chosen one. Does it make sense? Does the devil stop? Brings the next device. What's the next device? Identity. He begins to tweak it, tamper with it. 
I, listen, I don't have the time to teach this. I'm, I'm, I, there's somewhere I'm going because um, if, if, we, if we had the time to settle, I could show you from history and from scripture how each one of these nations had the unique character and ability to do this thing that they were doing. When the Greeks came, what, what did the Greeks come to do? The Greeks come to pull you from faith to logic. Philosophy. So the Greek are philosophers. When the Greeks came, what are Greeks trying to do? They are trying to, so if the attempt to tamper with your identity doesn't work, I hope you know that the next struggle is not about, okay, you know who you are in Christ. Right? You, know, you know that I am the redeemed, I am saved, I am the next set of battles you are going to face as a believer are going to be whether you will choose to live in the realm of faith or live in the realm of logic. And the Greeks do a good job at pulling you from the realm of faith to the realm of logic. That's a device. How many of you know that that's a device? The devil attempting to make you logical. That's a device. How many of you know that the enlightenment, the renaissance, right? The age of reason, the dawn of the age of reason. Science, all of these elements are attempting to make you logic that's greek at work you know miles moreau said something and when i studied it more closely i began to understand it andrew miles moreau said that up till now the greeks are some of the strongest speaking devices or voices in the earth up to now that empire seems to be done and gone and yet the device is still in play because it's a device but after the Greeks came the Romans. And what are the Romans? The Romans are known for their brutality. So the Romans are persecution. So the enemy first will present glory. If you overcome, then he will come to take your identity. If you overcome, then he will make you logical. If he fails, then he will... Brutality. That's when you see the other color of the devil. That's when he will show you his true color. You understand that when he was showing you glory, it was not because he loved you. And let me tell you, let me tell you, in your life right now, if, there, if you are ever at any place where you are questioning who God is, it's because of one of these four devices. You are either questioning God because you are wondering, how can the people of the world just like David, you are standing and saying, but I looked at the unrighteous. I saw their prosperity. Lord, I've been faithful serving you. I'm in sanctuary. I clean. Do you know how many chairs I've, if they put together cumulatively the chairs I've cleaned in the past three years. My goodness. And you don't understand why the Lord seems to be dull as to the things that concerns you. It's a device. Did you hear what I just said? Listen, if any one of us is questioning who God is, it is because of one of these devices. If it's not that, it is that you have entered into a crisis of identity. You don't know who you are. You're asking the questions of meaning. What am I here for? Who am I? What am I? Am I this? Am I that? And the world is saying to you, no, you are this, you can be this, you can be that. And you are in a, in a, in a state of confusion. Why? Because your identity is mixed up, messed up. Or else, it is that you are dealing with the Greeks. What are the Greeks? Every time you turn back, you come to church, God gives you promises. The moment you walk out of here, what comes knocking? Reality. And what, what does reality? Reality will, will make you question who God is. Lord, are you real? Because this is real. Do you understand? My hunger is more real right now. Some of you don't want to say it. Don't be religious. It's why God is not helping you. It's because you are keeping a form. Amen. Is anyone still with me? And if that doesn't work, what happens? Persecution. It's either you are going through fire, right? <laughs> you are going through fire. And you are questioning, Kai, God, where are you? 
this fire. Where are you? But listen, how many of us know that it's not only the devil that has devices? <laughs> how many of you know that actually the devil learned it from God? <laughs> that the devil does not have the ability to create knowledge. All knowledge comes from who? God. <laughs> The devil has to study God to find it. You know, it was Isaiah who said that it is the Lord who made the blacksmith. The same Lord who made the one who fashions the weapon. Then he stopped and says to you, no device formed against you shall prosper. And do you remember the way Baba said it? Baba says that when the, when the, when the, when the blacksmith is fashioning the device, the Lord who made him and the technology as he is returning, he finds out that you have outgrown this particular size of the device. So he returns and he tries to adjust the device. When he's returning, you have... So guess what? You just gave the devil... <laughs> is there someone who wants to say, my life must give the devil a job? <laughs> I'm telling you, listen. Let me, when the devil says, I'm going to and fro the air, don't praise him. Someone is giving him. He's unemployed. So let's employ him. <laughs> there's, a, there's a song. There's a song I, I, I've been singing. And this is one of my personal songs. You know, I have songs that are very dear to me. This one is one of it. Is by by, I'm not I'm not. Um, you know, Corey said, "Let me hear the key." Corey said, "I'm in love with the spirit. They cannot understand it. I'm in love with the Holy Ghost. They cannot comprehend it. I've become a riddle to those who have known me before." I've become a parable that they can never solve. You see, that line has entered me and be. I'm a riddle. I'm a parable. And I don't mind being that to men, but most importantly, it's for the it's for the devil. I added, I don't mind being mean that to men. Do you understand? I don't. I'm in love with the spirit. They cannot understand it. I'm in love with the Holy Ghost. They cannot comprehend it. I've become a riddle to those who have known me before. I've become a parable that they can never solve. See, say that the enemy can never figure me out. Do you know what John 3 said? John 3 said, we're like the wind. Anyone who is born of God is like the wind. The Bible says that no one sees where he comes from or where he goes. I. Listen. If they see you every time, we're, we're not sure what gave birth to you. Because if it's the wind that gave birth to you. <laughs> Are you with me? So let's go back to Zechariah. Listen to it. Listen to it. Verse 20 and verse 21. Verse 21. And the Lord showed me what? 20, 21. So let's go. 20 first, then 21. Good. And the Lord showed me how many? How many? Four carpenters. How many carpenters? Four carpenters. Give me the ESV. The 
ESV uses a different word. It says, the Lord shows me, how many showed me, how many? Craftsmen. Craftsmen. Now, 21. 21. And I said, so Zechariah was the one asking, right? What are these? And I said, what are these coming to do? What are the four craftsmen coming to do? Then the angel said, these, then he turned to the four horns that he first saw, right? Then he said, these are the horns that have scattered Judah so that no one raised his head. These are the horns that are always working against the child of promise. Anyone that has the promise and the covenant, these are the horns that are attempting to work against you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? Any child of promise from Abraham till today, everyone that's a seed of Abraham, these are the horns that are attempting to work against your life. What are these coming to do? He said, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one raised his head. And these have come to terrify them. Who have come to terrify them? The craftsmen. Say with me, the craftsmen have come to terrify the horns. Aye. <laughs> you see, someone who terrifies something is called what? There's a word, terror. <laughs> someone who terrifies another is called, you know, but me, I like to call it easy. <laughs> Someone who terrifies another can also be called terrible. <laughs> so when you say to the Lord, you are terrible. So terrible. Amen. And these have come to terrify them. Listen, the Lord has prepared what will always terrify and terrorize. I hope you know that it's not just that they deal with it. No, they terrify and they terrorize the horns that attempt to scatter you and put your head down. Listen, every time you see a man scattered and his head down, these horns have passed by. Because we don't have the time. But part of what you would have read and seen there in that, in that, in that vision that Nebuchadnezzar saw, he, said, he says, and I saw a stone cut without hands. And the Bible says, in the day, I, God, in the day of these kings, listen, if you understand what this means, Pastor Rampi, scripture cannot say in the day of these kings. Because all four of them were not ruling at good. So scripture would have said, and in the day of the Roman king, a stone came cut without hands. That's what scripture says. In the day of these kings. Why? Because these have become the civilizations of Babylon. The what? The civilizations of Babylon. This is what the Lord said to Daniel. There's no kingdom that will rise again greater. These are still the civilizations of the earth. This is still how the earth works. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? If the devil anywhere ever puts down a child of promise, he used one of these four civilizations. Is either you were Lord, Lord, tempted by a false glory, or you were brutally dealt with and your identity stolen from you. Or you were convinced by the philosophies of men and everything. Do you understand why Paul said, don't let anyone spoil you by the philosophies of men. Or you have let the cares and troubles of this world steal from you. These are the civilizations of the earth. Let's return. Let's return to Zechariah. So, 
So he said that but these are come to fray them to cast out the horns of the Gentiles which do what? Lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. Fine. So with me, I bless the Lord for he's the one who puts me together and lifts up my countenance. Craftsmen. But who are these craftsmen? Now you're not going to get the story properly. And I'm not going to go into that. You should go and read it. Go and read the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 1, 2, 3. But I'll give you, I'll give you a, a summary of the story. Right? So, after they returned, after the captives returned, they began to rebuild. When they began to rebuild, some of the people, the surrounding nations, what did they do? They came to them and said, let's join you and build with you so that we worship the Lord your God. What did, what did they say to them? No, we cannot mix with you. Are you seeing the same devices? We cannot mix with you. What did they now do? The same people that said, let's build together with you. Do you remember what they did? They turned against them. They sat down, wrote letters, sent to Susa, when they collected the letters, they said to them, go and tell them to stop building that thing. Do you know how long it took Israel? So Israel would start. The nations will gather down, make noise. And they will what? They will stop. The same civilizations. The Lord brings you a promise. You arise. You are laboring in the direction of the promise. Then what happens? They gather, they make noise. And what happens? You stop. Something that should have taken you two years. You rise, you attempt to take a step. The devil returns to you with the question of identity. Guess what? Stop. You arise, you attempt to move. The devil returns to you with the question of logic. Have you even seen how much you need to do this thing? How much is in your account? Go and print your back statement. Has your account ever, ever put together the past 10 years? <laughs> has, has your account ever seen that amount of money? They say, ah, it's true. It's true. Then instantly, guess what we do? We postpone the manifestation. We say someday the Lord will visit us. Then you carry the promise and throw it into the future. Then you return back to living your life. Because somehow you feel it to be wrong for you to carry the promise and bury it. So what do you do? Now that's what we do. We don't bury our talents. We throw them into the future. We don't bury them. We just keep postponing. And the moment you get close to that future, guess what you do? You pick it up again. Throw it into the future. When you get close to it, you pick it up again. What do you do? Throw it into the future. Everything about your life is still in the future. Every promise God has made to you, you have thrown it in the future. One day, I'll be a great missionary. One day, I will start that ministry. One day, I will win souls. One day, I will heal the sick. A day is coming. The hour cometh and now
Hebrew says, when, if you hear his voice, today, when, today, if you will hear his voice. So everything about you, you carry on throwing the future. And I'm not just talking about throwing it in the future because, no, we're not even seeing, sir. Because there are times that what you are doing is waiting. And that's what pastor has been teaching. While we wait. So you can see the faith of a man by his current posture in waiting. So we're not talking about that it must. Do you understand that? That, but anyone who is waiting, you will... Listen, this is how I've, I've always said it. Belief, when someone believes a thing, belief is visible. Belief is what? It's visible. You can't say, I believe, and your belief is hidden. It's hidden from the eyes of men. Belief is visible. When you see a man that is waiting in faith, you can see the evidences of faith hanging around him. You will either trace it in his confession or trace it in his posture or trace it in his service or trace it in a man who believes you can never, ever, he can never hide his belief. Belief is, belief is never hidden. Amen. And so they will start and they will stop. They will start. How many of you know how long that they kept starting and stopping? How many of you have an idea how long? Open, open, um, give me Give me Haggai. Haggai chapter 2. Give me Haggai 2. How many of you know how long? As I said, I, I can't summarize that story because you need to read Haggai, Ezra, Zechariah to get, to get the complete picture. Because all these three works at the same time. Right? But listen, it took them how long? 23 years. How long? 23 years. 23 years of starting and stopping. Starting and stopping. There was a time for good 11 years, no block was added to what the Lord asked them to build. No single block was added. Does that sound like the story of someone? Does that sound like the story of someone? Haggai 2. Let's read from verse 4. Look at it. Verse 4. Yet now, be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord. Do you, do you remember Pastor at point was reading this verse a lot? When he told us to be strong. Do you remember that? Yet now, be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord. And be strong, O Joshua, son of Joseph, the high priest. And be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord. And work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. When pastor came and said we should work, how many of you really believed it and went to work? Because it's exactly part of what we're talking about. How many of you believed it? Believed the word and went to work? Or did we just hear the word? Because... Second Chronicles told us that believe the Lord and believe his prophet son. And that's exactly what led us talking about this. So how many of you believe the Lord and actually went to work? Let me show you something. Go back to Ezra quickly. Time is running against me, but let me try. Go to Ezra. Ezra 1. Let me show you a few things. I'll skip. I'll skip several things. So, um, Ezra 4. Go to Ezra 4. 
Ezra 4. Look at Ezra 4. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, what happened? Then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us, are you seeing it? Let us do what? So what was their first offer? Let's build with you. For we seek your, are you joking? As ye do. And we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Asher, which brought us up hither. Because it was Esarhaddon that brought them here. So what they are saying is, for close to, for over, for close to 200 years, that we've been here, we've been sacrificing to your God. We seek the same thing. We're looking for the same thing. Do you believe that? Next verse, next verse, next verse. Let's stop at verse five. Then we'll skip, we'll skip and read. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, ye have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, had commanded us, right? Verse four, then the people, then the people of the land, can you see that? What did that do to the people? Weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. Verse 5. Verse 5. And hired counselors against them to do what? To frustrate their purpose. Listen, you need to know that there is something trying to frustrate your purpose. That's part of your ignorance. You don't know it. That every time there's an attack on your identity, it's not your identity. It's not so that you can be walking about and saying I'm an idiot. It's that it wants to frustrate your purpose. Every time life is hard and difficult, it's so that it will do what? So that you will get up tomorrow and say that thing that the Lord says I can do. If eating is hard, ha, how much more change in the world? Even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Now let's jump, let's jump. Let's go to verse 17. So, verse 17, go to verse 17. 17. Then send the king an answer unto Rehum, the, the chancellor. So that was when they now wrote a letter. And to Shimshai, the scribe, unto the rest of their companions that dwelt in Samaria and unto the rest beyond the river. Peace and at such time. The letter which he sent unto us has been plainly read before me. Next verse. And I commanded and search had been made. And it is found that this city of old time had made insurrection against kings. And that rebellion and sedition have been made therein. There have been mighty kings also over Jerusalem which have ruled over all countries beyond the river and told tribute and custom was paid unto them. Go on. Give ye now commandment to cause these men to... Why is the devil after you? He is afraid of you. Read it. Go back. Go back to the last verse. 20. Verse 20. What does verse 20 says? There have been... Why did Pharaoh look at Israel and say, we need to deal with this one shrewdly? Why? He looked at them and he said, this, this people, one day if war breaks out between us, <laughs> we are done. We are done. The quality and caliber, when, when the Bible says, and a Pharaoh arose who did not know Joseph, you think it was about, he did not know, Egypt that kept accurate records of everything, Why is, why is the enemy frustrating your life? It's because you are king. The enemy knows what will happen. Let's go. Next verse. Verse 21. 21. Give ye now commandment to cause this men to cease and that this city not be builded until another commandment shall be given from me. Take heed now that you fail not to do this. Why should, should damage 
should damage grow to the heart of the kings. Next verse. Now, when the copy of the king, when King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Shimshai, the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem unto the Jews and made them to seize by how? That's the Romans. They started as Babylonians. Yeah? Then they went for their identity. How? They wrote to the king and said, go and search about these people. You need to know who they truly are. And when they found out who they are, what was the attack? The identity. Ezra 5. Go to verse 5. Chapter 5. Ezra 5. 1 and 2. Ezra 5. 1 and 2. Ezra 5. 1 and 2. I'm rounding up now, but I'm getting to the important stuff. Because there's only one reason why I said all this story today. And I'm going to say it now. Then the prophets, then who? Prophets. Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Next verse. Then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josadak, and began to build the house of God which is at Jerusalem and with them were the prophets of God helping them. Are you seeing God's craftsmen? God's craftsmen, there are four craftsmen two prophets, a king and a priest. Listen every time God wants to reorganize your life, bring you back into order so that he can gather you together, that your head can be lifted God sends you Two prophets. I always say two prophets. We don't mean two prophets. We mean because every time God speaks, you hear twice. So it's why God always sends two prophets. Once have you spoken. How many times have I heard? Twice. So God sends you a prophetic speaking and a prophetic speaking. God never speaks to you about one thing just once. He speaks again and again. But what are the prophets doing? Every time the prophets show up and speak, what happens? The Bible says, the king arose and the priest arose. Listen, the priest settles transactions between you and God. The king enables you to step out. But what's the starting point? The prophets. Do you understand what Chronicles said? Believe the Lord and believe he is. Let me tell you, God sends men to you. If you like, don't believe them. What is God's answer to weak hands and weak knees in building? Starts with what? Prophets. This was exactly what Zechariah saw. Go back to Zechariah. Go back to Zechariah where we read. This was exactly what Zechariah saw. Where we read earlier. Zechariah 8. Zechariah 8. 9 to 13. Zechariah 8, 9 to 13. 9, 9, 9. Thus says the Lord of hosts, let your hands, what? Let your hands be strong. Ye that hear in these days these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundations of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid that the temple might be built. Next verse. For before these days there was no hire for man, nor any hire for beast. Neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set all men, everyone against his. Next verse. But now I will not be unto, unto the residue of these people as in the former days, said the Lord of hosts. Next verse. Next verse. For the seed shall be prosperous the vine shall give her and the ground shall give her and the heavens shall give there and I will cause the remnant of these people to do what to possess their possessions how how listen believe the people the Lord has set over your life 
I wish God can change it. <laughs> Are you with me? Listen, listen. Let's, let's end tonight by, by realizing oh God. Look for, let's pray. We'll pray now. Look for, look for 23 to 27. Look for 23 to 27. And he said unto them, You will surely say unto me this proverb Physician, heal thyself. Now listen, listen. There's a fifth horn. There's what? A fifth horn. And I'm not trying to really explain it to you, but there's a fifth horn. It was that horn that Jesus was talking about when he stood before the people of Israel and he wept. And he said to them, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you. Do you see the word he used? Gather you. Why? They were scattered. But how I long to do what? To gather you. I say, Mother hen gathers her chicks. He says, but you have persistently refused to see me. I'm paraphrasing now. You have persistently did what? Refused to see me. Then he said, from now henceforth, you will see me no more until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Bible said, Jesus wept. Twice did Jesus weep. First, he wept over the cities of Israel. He's saying, look at why I came. To gather you. This is God's hope. That one more time, God's desire to have a nation of kings and priests be fulfilled. I hope you know that Jesus wasn't coming hoping that Israel would refuse him. As much as God in his wisdom designed that they would reject him so that we would receive him. That's the wisdom of God. But it was not the intention of Jesus. It is the wisdom of God. Jesus intended. Do you know that Jesus deliberately refused to go and preach to the lost nations? He would give his disciples instruction and he would say to them, Don't go to stay within. Stay within. Why? Jesus would look at a woman who would come and say, Give me healing for my child. You call her a dog. I didn't come for you. I came for my own. The Bible said he came to his own. His own did not receive him. And listen, listen. This is the, this is the fifth horn that I'm talking about. Because every time God settles to gather a people, guess what happens? This horn works against them. Why? Pastor Earl said, because the people never see the people God sent to them. So they remain scattered. Jesus wept over this. He looked at the nations to whom he was sent and he would weep over. Why? Because he was in their midst. They never saw him. They never saw him, sir. Was it a curse? I don't know. But they never saw him. Please go back to Luke. Stay there. Don't leave there. I'm already leading us to pray. Why Rampi? Look at what he began to say. He said, surely you people will say to me this proverb, physician, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here, where? In this country. Can you see the attitude? The attitude towards him was, you are saying a lot. You do what you are saying first. I hope you know that some of you is the reason why you have not received the people God has sent to you. Because there are evidences you are demanding from them that God didn't ask you to demand. It's none of your business. God said, believe. You, you are demanding certain evidences that God didn't ask you to demand. 
Next verse, next verse. We're praying. Because somebody's eye has to be opened. And in the opening of your eye, you will suddenly realize that all along, you have been surrounded with what the Lord has provided for you to live in the fullness of his purposes for you in his presence. And he said, verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth. Listen, he gave an example. So he stopped and he said, how many of you have ever considered that there was not only one widow in the days of Elias? This was what Jesus was saying. This was what he was literally saying. But I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias when the heaven was shut up three years and six months. When great famine was throughout all the land. Next verse. But unto none of them was Elias sent. Underline the word sent. Underline the word sent. Listen, some of you will live with the gifts of God in your life, but they will never be sent to you. Never. You are a widow, you also have needs, but they will never prophesy over your life. It's not because it is, Jesus was saying that the reason why they were not sent to other widows was that other widows did not have something this particular widow had. It was not a mistake. It wasn't just a random choice for an example. There was a posture of honor this particular widow had that Elisha was sent to her. Jesus was, remember, he was talking about what you will say, that a prophet has no honor. That's the context of his conversation. So he stopped and said, don't you think, some of you wonder why you are in the same church. Someone will come and say to you, the word blessed me. I believed it. See the results. And you, you are sitting down here. Ne you have not had one testimony for eight years. Why? There were many widows. Next verse, next verse. Let's finish, next verse. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of and none of them was cleansed save Naaman. Some of you before your eyes, people will live from other nations. They will walk into your house, meet your prophets, receive their cleansing, return to their cities, and you remain a leper. And it's not a curse. Say with me, I see God's craftsmen. Every one of you has God's craftsmen in your life. Your frustrations and your struggles. Go to Luke 19. Put your hand over your head. Say with me, Lord. By your spirit, I break the curse of the familiar. Listen, some of you have no idea how much familiarity has stolen from you. Some of you even think it's the man that is standing before you. It's not the man. He was sent by God. Did you see that he was sent? You're not receiving anything from the man. But God is watching how you honor the man to know whether he should give you through the man. Do you know that sometimes, sometimes even the man does not receive what you receive when you honor him. Some of you don't understand that. That even the man, sometimes, he does not enjoy what you enjoy when you honor him. Paul said we live our lives sometimes we're dying yet we're making other rich. How do you think that works? How do you think that works? Say with me, Lord, by your spirit, deliver me from familiarity. It is the fifth horn that always never allows you to be gathered by the Lord. 
Give me 41. Just 41 to 44. And I want you to pray. To start praying. I'm done. But I need to show you this. And when he was come near, he beheld the city. And what did he do? He wept over it. Saying, if thou hast known, even thou, at least in thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace. All right. Give me ESV. Please give me ESV. It's a saying. Would that ye even know, had known on this day, the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Say, Lord, open my eyes. Listen, there is an opening of eye that will never happen until you honor the people that the Lord has sent to you. I'm telling you, there's a blindness that comes with dishonor. Say, Lord, open my eyes. They are hidden from your eyes. Verse, let's go. Two more verses, verse 43 and 44. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground. You and your children within and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Say with me, oh Lord, I know the time of my visitation. I can't be ignorant. And just in case you think it's time in the future, don't throw it in the future. Right now, right now, you are in the midst of your visitation. Some of you are waiting for visitation or you are standing in the midst of visitation. See, let me tell you, as long as you have one person in your life speaking the word of God over you, you are in the center of your visitation. Turn around and look at your life. You know that there are people God has planted. I didn't say, because even you, if you want to ask logically, the permutations that brought them into your life, it doesn't even make sense. Those kind of people, they are the kind of people I'm talking about. They are the kind of people I'm talking about. You are standing right now, right there, in the midst of that. As long as you have one or two of that kind in your life, know that the Lord has not forsaken you. But let me tell you, if you refuse to see your visitation, a day will come, a day will come that the Bible says your enemy will come around you. He will surround you, tear you down. Not a stone will be left upon the other. Why? Because you did not know, God forbid. God forbid. Say with me, I hear. Say with me, I see. And I honor the craftsmen in my life. They are craftsmen God has given you. They are working in you. To bring out is the way the Lord has chosen to work. I wish the Lord can change it. I wish the Lord can change it. When pastor comes and prophesies, don't look at the man. Listen to what the craftsmen are saying. Listen to what they are doing. And you know, it's deliberate that I, I did not I did not make this simply about pastor because some of you there are friends in your life that if you can think well, you will sit down. And tell yourself, you know what? This person is not my friend, though. This, 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 this is the planting of the Lord. Some of you, that's your problem. You have looked at the planting of the Lord in your life and called it friend. And your inability to see that it is the gift of the Lord is what is dealing with you right now. It's deliberate that I didn't, I didn't make it simply just about pastor. It, pastor, we bless the Lord for the gift of pastor and his wife. To guide and steward this assembly. But I'm telling you. I'm telling you. You must stop right now. To renew through your mind's eyes. The honor. Say with me one more time. Lord I honor. Lord I see. I live in my visitation. I receive. The ones you have sent to me. And let me tell you. Receive and watch how your life will turn around. You have just two more minutes to pray. However you want to pray it, pray. This is a device too. Some of you, when the enemy does his device outside, messed you up, you return. All you need is for someone to stand over you and say, you know what? 
you know what? You are free. And that's it, that's it, that's it. And yet you come, you carry needless pain, you carry foolishness and idiocy simply because you, you are asking yourself, how can I? It is still men that God will use to change your life. Still men. Listen, don't let anything, I'm praying for you now, by the Spirit, that if there's anything that has begun to scar, scar your senses of honor, let the Lord heal it right now in the name of Jesus. Because some of you, your senses of honor has been scarred. It has been bruised. So you, you are struggling to honor. I pray that you find healing right now in the presence of the Lord. That the Lord can heal and renew and restore your senses of honor in the name of Jesus. So much word comes over us. Speakings that qualify to catapult us from being mere people to being kings in high places. And yet, seasons come and they go. The words rise a bit and they lay flat. Why? Because men are not receiving. Men are beginning to, they are not noticing the device. The device is an internal device. It's an internal compromise. It's you working against yourself. That you are looking at all God has sent to you and you are choosing to dishonor it. You are refusing your hour of visitation. Oh Lord. in a few minutes I want you to thank God can you let thanksgiving rise thank God for the people the Lord has planted in your life thank God for the craftsmen <laughs> begin by blessing God for the set man over this house begin by blessing God from your heart for pastor Bless God. Bless God. Some of those people that, that they are plantings of the Lord that you have turned to friends. You have turned to, look at them too, through your mind's eye and bless God for them. I can't hear Thanksgiving rise. Can't, let, can, can you let the fragrance of Thanksgiving rise? <laughs> True honor, godly honor. The kind of honor that makes us so up all that God is doing in our midst is returning in our midst. I don't care what men have done to you. Know that men are still the vehicle of your blessing and progress. I don't care what men have done to you. Know that men are still the vehicles for your increase, prosperity and establishment. Believe the Lord. Believe his prophets and you will prosper. Bless the Lord. Giver, giver, giver of everything. From you all blessings flow. Giver, giver, giver of everything. From you all blessings flow.
say blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord it says you see me no more until you say some of you will return tonight and you will see God in your life why because you said blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord Say it again. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Say it again. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. One more time. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Thank you, Father. Do you have an offering to give? Put together that offering now. Let's receive it. We're done. Were you blessed tonight? We have come to the end of today's sermon. You can listen to more sermons from www.pastorchintok.com or listen to our teaching podcast from Google, Apple and Spotify podcast services using the channel The GLA Podcast.